Avoiding the liberal label, Democrats compete to see who's more progressive. A unique view of the presidential race, Karen Santorum shares her husband's disappointment. Source of strength. I pray that we will see every single child as our own. The National Prayer Breakfast brings leaders together. And pro-life issues in court. We follow two high-profile Texas cases. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, February 4th, 2016. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm Brian Patrick, and just five days out from the New Hampshire primary, polls show Bernie Sanders leading Hillary Clinton among Democrats. I have an uphill climb, and I'm going to climb as high and hard as I can because I want to make my case to the people of New Hampshire. On the heels of her razor-thin victory in Iowa, Hillary Clinton is casting herself as the underdog in New Hampshire, but rival Bernie Sanders insists he's the one battling tough odds. Of course we're an underdog. New Hampshire may be the Vermont senator's backyard, but he says it's Clinton's stomping ground. Secretary Clinton obviously ran here in 2008, and she won. Her husband ran here several times before that. So this is her fourth campaign in that family here in New Hampshire. Wednesday's New Hampshire town hall was a clash of the titles as the political rivals fought for another important credential in the historically liberal state. I am a progressive who gets results. Secretary Clinton said, well, I'm paraphrasing, some people call me a moderate, and I proudly you know, say that I am a moderate. I love moderates, but you can't be a moderate and a progressive, they are different. New Hampshire holds the nation's first presidential primary in less than a week. It remains to be seen whether Clinton's progressive pitch will win over Democrats in the Granite State, where recent polls show Sanders with a double-digit lead. Clinton and Sanders debate tonight on MSNBC without Martin O'Malley, who dropped out Monday after his poor showing in Iowa. Donald Trump's jet is forced to make an emergency landing in Tennessee. En route to a campaign event in Little Rock, Arkansas Wednesday, the pilot of that Boeing 757 reported engine trouble. A Trump campaign spokeswoman called it a minor mechanical issue. The plane landed safely at Nashville International Airport. The FAA is investigating. Exiting GOP candidate Rick Santorum endorses fellow Catholic Marco Rubio. Santorum, who pulled out of the race Wednesday, calls the Florida senator a natural leader. Rubio finished third in the Iowa caucuses, just behind Ted Cruz and Donald Trump. Santorum's wife is disappointed her husband didn't gain more support in his bid to be president. Karen Santorum spoke with our Jason Calvi during Monday's Iowa caucuses. She says she's made a lot of friends on the campaign trail but also expresses disappointment that more people don't understand what a good man her husband is. This time around the polls are not, not the best for your husband. Is that, is that hard for you as a wife to see that? It is because my husband's such a great guy, and I feel like I do believe with all my heart and soul he's the most qualified in so many, in so many ways, in every possible way. Rick Santorum got only 1% of the Iowa vote this year. In 2012, he actually finished first. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. House Republican leaders plan for the post-Obama presidency. Today, they announced six new task forces to address major issues facing the nation in the year ahead. Wyatt Goolsby reports from Capitol Hill tonight. Brian, House Speaker Paul Ryan is once again pushing for what he calls his bold pro-growth agenda for America, and that's really the purpose behind this new group of task forces, is to address a whole host of issues related to the future of the country. Speaker Ryan joined Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy in laying out the details of what each of the task force will cover. That includes topics like national security, tax reform, reducing regulatory burdens, health care, poverty, and restoring constitutional authority. Now, today's announcement comes on the heels of last month's Republican retreat, where members of Congress huddled together to figure out their future and vision for the country in the next couple of years ahead. I think people are used to the speaker sort of consolidating power and predetermining the outcome of everything around here. That's not the kind of speaker I'm going to be. Ryan made it clear that this group of six task forces will come up with an agenda that will be in sync with the next president, but all of that hinges on he or she being a Republican. Ryan also says these task forces will take input from all members of Congress and both parties, but so far, all the members listed are Republicans. Brian? Wyatt Goolsby at the Capitol. Thanks, Wyatt. And a drug company chief infuriates members of Congress today by refusing to answer their questions. 
Martin Shkreli is accused of hiking the price of a potentially life-saving drug by more than 5,000 percent. He was called to testify today on Capitol Hill and appeared to smirk pretty much throughout his hour-long grilling. These companies did not invest funds to research or develop these drugs. They bought them, jacked up the prices, took as much money as they could out of the pockets of patients, hospitals, and others, and put those funds into their own coffers. I've called this money blood money. Screlly's attorney says his client took the fifth today because he's facing criminal charges. David Daleiden will not accept a proposed plea deal on charges related to his undercover expose of Planned Parenthood. His attorney says Daleiden is prepared to go to trial if he can't quash the indictment. He's not interested in a probation offer that would keep him out of prison. Daleiden posted $3,000 bond today and made two court appearances in Houston. Daleiden and Sandra Merritt were indicted on felony charges for using a false ID in their investigation. His next hearing is March 28th. Well, in less than a month, the Supreme Court delves into a Texas law requiring abortion clinics to meet surgical standards. Abortionists must also have admitting privileges in a nearby hospital. Today, those who filed briefs in support of the bill spoke out at a news conference in the Lone Star State Capitol. John Sego, legislative director for Texas Right to Life, joining us by Skype from Austin. John, you were at a news conference today. Tell us, if you would, what the argument is included in the Texas Right to Life brief that has been filed. Yes, sir. We joined uh, Texas Eagle Forum yesterday in filing a brief in the Supreme Court in support of pro-life bill, House Bill 2, that we passed here in Texas in 2013. And uh, in that brief, we argue that the Texas legislature uh, was actually passing this as a necessary measure to protect women's health here in Texas. And we're arguing that in light of the atrocities that we saw in the Gosnell case and some accusations that we had at the time in 2013 of an abortionist here in Texas that they were actually calling the Texas Gosnell. Uh, and there were terrible accusations of the low standards he was having in his clinic in light of those accusations and in light of the inspection reports that we were looking at in the legislature, we knew that the abortion industry was not going to self-regulate and we needed to pass pieces of legislation that raised the medical standard. Also, your office, your organization is supporting David Daleiden in his case in Houston. Tell us about the petition that's been signed by a lot of people to support Daleiden. Yes, we've had hundreds of thousands of pro-lifers uh, sign a petition that clarifies uh, that there was a serious miscarriage of justice in Houston uh, earlier whenever we had a grand jury who was uh, told to go and to look at these undercover videos uh, of a Houston abortionist and abortion clinic to look at whether there were crimes that were committed from state and federal crimes to actually investigate, see if there was anything on these videos that needed to be uh, followed up on in court. What we had was the grand jury actually turned around and indicted the pro-life activists, the two individuals that were responsible for bringing the ugly truths, what's going on in this abortion clinic in Houston, actually indicted them for violating two separate federal laws. So this was uh, actual mishandling of the case from the district attorney's office, and Texas Right to Life joins the hundreds of thousands of pro-lifers who are very concerned about this development. And that petition delivered to the Harris County District Attorney there in Houston. John Sego, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And President Obama delivers his final address this morning to the annual National Prayer Breakfast here in Washington. He warned of the impact of fear in public life, urging those in power to abide by their faith, quote, even when no one is watching. Lauren Ashburn reports from the White House tonight. It's an annual tradition drawing religious leaders of all faiths. And today, President Obama continued to promulgate the message coming out of the White House this week, inclusion for all religions. Amazing grace. With the incomparable Andrea Bocelli setting the tone, the president spoke about the need to overcome fear through faith. For me, and I know for so many of you, faith is the great cure for fear. 
Jesus is a good cure for fear. God gives believers the power, the love, the sound mind required to conquer any fear. His remarks came a day after making his first visit to an American mosque where he told Muslims they are welcome here in the U.S. The National Prayer Breakfast is a chance for politicians to pause politics and gather in fellowship and reflection. It has not always lived up to that billing. In 2013, keynote speaker Dr. Ben Carson raised his political profile by offering his alternative to Obamacare. That helped launch his own White House bid. Today, not only the president waded into political territory, House Speaker Paul Ryan mixed prayer and politics in his welcoming remarks. When people say we're praying for someone or something, the attitude in some quarters these days is don't just pray, do something about it. Thing is, when you are praying, you are doing something about it. The speaker noted what he described as growing impatience with prayer. He seemed to reference criticism of politicians who offer thoughts and prayers to victims of mass shootings, but oppose tightening gun laws. Brian. Thanks, Lauren Ashburn at the White House. It's great to have Republican Congressman Jeff Fortenberry of Nebraska back with us. And Jeff, you attended the prayer meeting this morning, the prayer breakfast. What did you think of the president's speech? Well, the overall event was a lovely, uplifting, unifying event. And it has a long, long history and a central focus, namely gathering people in the name of Jesus. And interestingly, this attracts people from all over the world. I had someone in my office who was coming to the prayer breakfast who was a Hindu. She was with Maronite Rite Catholics. Her husband is Zoroastrian. They live in the Middle East and they were bringing guests here because they were so moved by their own experience. So that's the nature of it. The president, I thought, uh, gave a quite moving speech. It was very personal. He uh, was transparent and even vulnerable in it. Uh, talked about his own kids and how his own fears when they leave, are they gonna call? Made some good jokes. Uh, some of the burdens of office. So I thought overall it was good. However, I, I have to say when I, when I leave the event, even though there's beauty and unity, you still carry with you this sense of sadness about deep divisions about what faith really means. For instance, it's, it's very ironical. The president said, in America, all Americans can practice their faith freely. And yet the little sisters of the poor, for instance, are having to sue the president and his administration in order to be able to practice their faith, their rights of conscience. They don't see that as worship. They, yeah, they, they want to say worship versus faith. And we know so, that as Catholics, it's overall. This is the, the core dilemma as to what really yeah. faith means. But I don't want to dampen the importance of the event. outcome of the event. It wasn't yeah. good. How does your Catholic faith and prayer play into your role representing your constituents on Capitol Hill? Well, I, I believe that a person is of mind and a heart and a, and a soul. And just like you have to exercise the body in order to stay fit, you need to exercise the soul. And by lifting the mind and heart to God, asking for his help, you not only place yourself in a position to stay on the right path, but you sensitize your own conscience, not only to the demands of virtue, but to the needs of others. And particularly those who are vulnerable, particularly those who are poor. And so um, it's absolutely essential. And it's interesting how I think most members of Congress would agree with that statement. And we're grateful for that. Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, thanks for joining us tonight. Good to be with you as always. Thank you. Up next, tracking the spread of Zika. The virus is changing some travel plans. And you'll never guess how much a Super Bowl 50 ticket could cost. Thanks for joining us this Thursday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention jumps into the debate over contraception. CDC has long told women of childbearing age to prevent fetal alcohol syndrome not to drink if they would, could become pregnant. Well, now a CDC doctor adds what women who are not trying to get pregnant should make sure that they have a conversation about birth control. University of Notre Dame professor Carter Sneed writes, the cultural assumptions in the CDC report are striking. Contraception is seen as a neutral and ignores the lifestyle the church invites us to. Well, the CDC also is the agency responsible for tracking the Zika virus. We can take you inside their emergency operation center. Dr. Steve Redd says the CDC is monitoring the spread of Zika around the world. 
When we activate the operations center for an emergency response, we bring people, the scientific experts from throughout CDC together in one place. Dozens of Americans caught the Zika virus after visiting countries where the infection is spreading through mosquito bites. Major airlines say they'll allow staff members who are pregnant or might become pregnant to opt out of flights to those areas where Zika is a concern. Delta and United says pilots and flight attendants flying to Latin America or the Caribbean can switch routes with no repercussions. The World Health Organization has declared a global health emergency because of that mosquito-borne virus. Well, as scientists investigate a possible link between the Zika virus and birth defects, a Wisconsin mom shares her son's story. She hopes to help others better understand a condition called microcephala. He steals your heart. You know, you just, he engages with you and he can light up a room. Meet Ira Conrad, a playful nine-month-old who is curious about everything. But Ira isn't able to sit or pull himself up just yet and his head is smaller than average. He has microcephaly, a severe birth defect suddenly thrust into the spotlight because of the rapidly spreading Zika virus. The risk to the fetus is what is causing that alarm. If a pregnant woman develops a Zika virus infection during pregnancy, that virus can cross the placenta and infect the baby. In Ira's case, his mother had another virus while pregnant that could have caused his condition. Doctors are also doing genetic testing to look for answers. I try to not do the what ifs, you know, because there are so many what ifs. Had we done this or had we tested this or had we asked that question? Because there are different levels of severity with microcephaly and brain development, Dunn says they take everything day by day. The part that's upsetting for me or scary for me is not knowing what it means long term. With thousands of suspected new cases of microcephaly, doctors hope the attention can help provide some answers. Maybe this means another mom doesn't have to go through what I did, you know, to get a diagnosis and an understanding of what their child is going through. And a renowned Catholic genetic engineer is recognized by Legatus with the John Cardinal O'Connor Pro-Life Award. We're Skyping with Dr. Teresa Deicher from Seattle. Dr. Deicher is president of Sound Choice Pharmaceutical Institute. It's so good to have you with us on News Nightly. Thank you, Dr. Deicher. It's a pleasure to be with you. Congratulations. You've recently been honored by Legatus. For what pro-life work was that honor given? Well, we were honored for our work to end human trafficking in biomedical research and our efforts to bring moral alternatives to the market to replace the use of aborted fetal cells. Give us an idea why embryonic stem cell research is morally wrong and researching adult stem cells or postnatal stem cells, as you call them, really have much better results and are morally acceptable. Embryonic stem cell research requires the destruction of a human embryo, the destruction of a human being, and that is always morally wrong. In contrast, Adult stem cells don't require harm to anyone. And more importantly, when we use them, they're safe, they're effective, and they're affordable. David Delayden and his Center for Medical Research are very much in the news this week. Do you have a connection with David and the work that he did? Well, we do, and it was actually our work that led David to pursue the current expose, the Planned Parenthood expose. He read about our work to end human trafficking and the use of aborted babies in biomedical research and contacted me four years ago telling me that he wanted to do an expose. I'm surprised that it goes back that far. We appreciate that insight. And finally, there's a lot of concern about vaccine and the source of some of the vaccines that were required to give our children why is Sound Choice supporting alternative cell lines in this area of vaccines? We are supporting and developing alternative cell lines because once we accept the use of aborted babies for any area of medicine, we open the door for subsequent abuses. And so we need to make sure that all of our medicines are morally acceptable. Dr. Teresa Deicher Skyping with us from Seattle. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me, Brian. It's a pleasure. Coming up, a new push to protect Syrian refugees as dozens of nations pledge aid. And two nations, one faith. 
how the Pope's upcoming visit to the Mexican border unites Catholics. Pope Francis encouraging us not to fear death, calling it a light that illuminates life. He adds the most beautiful inheritance parents can leave their children is the faith. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. World leaders pledge more than $10 billion today to help Syrian refugees. The money will be used to provide schools, shelter and jobs for people fleeing Syria's civil war. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says the situation is worsening. But obviously if people are reduced to eating grass and leaves and killing uh, stray animals in order to survive on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, that is something that should tear at the conscience of all civilized people. Jordan's King Hussein says that country has reached its limit, now harboring hundreds of thousands of refugees. Preparations for the Pope's visit to the Texas-Mexico border near their final phase this week. Local organizers are drawing support from Chicago-based Catholic Extension. Joe Boland, Vice President of Mission for Catholic Extension, joining us from Chicago. Joe, how is Catholic Extension involved in the visit of Pope Francis to uh, Ciudad Juarez later this month? So Catholic Extension is involved in several ways. Uh, first and foremost, we are providing professional event planners who can bring expertise in organizing this event. Uh, secondly, we're um, also helping with the fundraising activities around it. And then thirdly, we are a major event sponsor for the diocese. And, um, you know, this is a major undertaking for them. Any papal visit can be very daunting for any diocese, especially one like El Paso that doesn't have the same resources as some of these larger archdioceses. And the turnaround time has been very quick. Uh, it's only been two months since the Pope announced uh, his visit. And uh, given that it's happening in a border region, there's many um, comp complexities surrounding the security of this and uh, handling all that with law enforcement. But they're, ver they're looking forward to a very, very wonderful and prayerful moment for themselves. Love your hashtag, Two Nations, One Faith. Explain what that means for us as Catholics. The Diocese of El Paso and the Catholics on the U.S. side feel a, a great sense of kinship with those who are on uh, the Mexican side. They see themselves as one great community, one great metropolis. And, and not just as, as neighbors, um, they see themselves as one in faith, uh, that they're fellow Catholics um, across that river, and that we share the same baptism, that we share the same Eucharist with them. And uh, this is a moment where our universal pastor, Pope Francis, can come shine a light on that reality. He comes as our universal pastor, and uh, he comes to bridge those divisions that exist between nations, and he comes to us as the pastor of us all. Very symbolic, and I know that Pope Francis wants it to be that way. Joe, give us a brief snapshot of the mission of Catholic Extension. So Catholic Extension's mission for the past 110 years has been to strengthen the Catholic Church in the United States. Uh, and we do that by uh, supporting communities that are often in, in struggling areas of the nation. We're building up churches. We are fortifying faith communities. And uh, we've always had a presence in the U.S.-Mexico border region. It's a very exciting region. There's a lot of growth happening there. And we know that this event coming up is really a, a very, very significant historic moment for them. And we're just pleased to be able to share with them in this wonderful moment in time. Joe Bolin with Catholic Extension. Thanks for joining us, Joe. Thank you very much. So the event in El Paso is at the Sun Bowl. There are still tickets available. You can visit twonationsonefaith.com for those tickets. Also, catholicextension.org is where you can find more information about that uh, agency and its mission. Super Bowl 50 could soon be the most expensive sporting event in U.S. history. A ticket tracking site reports the average price is now just shy of $5,000. The Denver Broncos and Carolina Panthers play Sunday at Levi's Stadium in Santa Clara, California. It's the first Super Bowl in the Silicon Valley in more than three decades. The area's high average income is likely a factor in the high prices. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Tonight, we leave you with Andrea Bocelli singing Amazing Grace at today's National Prayer Breakfast. Amazing Grace.